So Brian Parr is going to be talking about grain and fiber production. And Brian, I will let you introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Um, yeah, my name is Brian Parr. Uh, I'm the agronomist for Legacy Hemp. Uh, our company primarily deals with uh, seed, uh, seed supplying for farmers, both grain and fiber. Uh, we also are uh, contracting with farmers as well to buy back that grain production uh, this year and soon uh, the fiber as well. So one of the first things I wanted to just touch on of uh, kind of what this plant is, uh, this is a dicotyledonous plant, meaning that it has two cotyledon leaves as it comes out of the, the soil. Uh, we could think of this very similarly to soybeans. Um, it is primarily dioecious, meaning that it has uh, two separate plants, uh, one male plant and one female plant. Uh, and sometimes this plant can be monaceous, where we have both male and female flowering parts on the same plant. Uh, sometimes this is referred to as uh, hermaphrodites. Uh, usually the gender uh, can be identified uh, within four to six weeks after planting. Uh, usually the males will be the first to be able to be identified, uh, with the females coming shortly thereafter. Uh, reproduction does occur through pollination. Uh, pollination can usually last between two to four weeks. Uh, once pollination has uh, finished, 100% uh, uh, of the male plants will completely die. Uh, so at harvest time, uh, with a grain, grain crop specifically, uh, you will only have female plants that will be actually alive at, at harvest. Uh, so hemp is a photo period dependent crop. Uh, it's a short day crop, which means that uh, as the days get shorter, uh, and more specifically our nighttime hours get longer, uh, this is what initiates flowering. Uh, so really we're looking at uh, the, the summer solstice, June 21st, any time after that, uh, we should start seeing these plants uh, go into their reproductive phase. Uh, plant height is usually determined by many factors, environmental, uh, but uh, uh, very specific to the type of hemp being grown. Uh, for grain type varieties, we usually see a height in that four to seven feet tall range. Uh, fiber is generally uh, in that eight to 14 feet, uh, but we can see fiber crops reach a height of 18 to 20 feet in, in some cases. Uh, roots will typically reach depths of one to two feet. Uh, on wet years, we're going to see them shorter. On drier years, they're likely getting to be longer than that. So just, just kind of a range there. Uh, the growth rate of this crop, once we hit the rapid growth stage, is anywhere between one to three inches per day. So very fast growing once it hits that rapid growth stage. And that stage usually begins somewhere between day 30 and 45 after planting. So there are really three primary types of hemp. Uh, we have our cannabidiol or our CBD. Uh, we have fiber and we also have grain. I'm going to touch today on fiber and grain and, and uh, we have other speakers today to touch on the CBD after this presentation. Uh, so, the first one I want to discuss is the fiber hemp. Uh, this is more similar to growing forages or hay. Uh, the planting stock that we use for this is seed, and our planting method is usually a grain drill, a broadcast seeder, or even a brilliant seeder. Uh, our planting rate is going to be between 40 and 60 pounds per acre. Uh, this is double the rate of a grain crop uh, for several reasons, uh, mainly because uh, the increased seeding rate will allow these plants to uh, thin their stalks. Uh, we'll have uh, smaller stalks, which is more desirable in a true fiber type uh, production system. Uh, and it also encourages uh, quicker, uh, longer growth by the plants because of the competition. Uh, our harvest method, 
uh, we have a few processes here. Uh, you can see in the upper photo that we are mowing this crop. Uh, this, this mowing will happen uh, at the stage of the, the bottom photo there, which is right at the beginning of pollination. Usually uh, the first 20%, uh, within the first 20% of males pollinating, uh, that is when the, the fiber crop should be harvested. There's no seed set in, in fiber production. Uh, raking will occur after uh, several days of breading once it's been mowed. Uh, this raking event will happen uh, one to three times, just depending on how the environment is, how the redding process is happening. Uh, usually the redding process will occur over a period of uh, two to four weeks. So it's a very long drawn out period of time. Uh, after the redding is finished, uh, then we will go back and, and uh, either round bale or preferably large square bale uh, the stalks. And once they're baled, uh, we, we prefer to have the bales at a 10% moisture or less. Uh, depending on the processors that you're looking to sell this to, it may be able to be shipped immediately. Uh, most likely, farmers will have to store this crop, preferably under a shed or, or uh, at least out of the elements until it is ready to go to the processor. Uh, so the second type of hemp is uh, grain. Uh, this is more similar to growing small grains like wheat. Uh, our planting stock again here is by seed. Uh, and here we have our planting method is either a grain drill, broadcast seeder, brilliant seeder, or we can even use a corn planter uh, to plant on 15 inch rows, 22 inch rows, or possibly 30 inch rows if if we desire to do that. Um, I, I will say that the, the primary method with this uh, model is with a grain drill or an air drill. Uh, planting rates is going to be half of the fiber crop uh, in that 25 to 35 pounds per acre. Uh, in this uh, production system, we want a, a thicker stock to be able to handle the, the weight of the grain head on top. Um, Harvesting is going to happen with a combine, like what we see up in the upper right-hand corner there. Uh, when harvest happens with this crop, obviously in the picture there, we see a lot of green material in the, in the stalks. Uh, we're trying to target between 12 and 18 percent moisture with the grain at harvest, which does leave quite a lot of uh, green material in the plant at that stage. Uh, so uh, we recommend uh, that once the grain is harvested in the combine, that we have uh, approximately four hours uh, before that grain will start to heat and spoil. So we recommend that uh, it gets cleaned immediately after harvest uh, and then put into aeration bins to start drying with forced air. Uh, we don't want to run the grain through a grain dryer uh, because uh, of its oil content, we risk having dryer fires uh, and uh, at 120 degrees Fahrenheit, we will start to oxidize that oil and it will start to spoil uh, just by the heat itself. So aeration is, is the preferred method for drying. Uh, so some of the soil and uh, climate uh, requirements for this crop. Uh, this crop is a, a, is a plant that prefers very well-drained soils. Uh, our sandy to loamy soils tend to be best suited because they are well-drained. Uh, heavy clay soils uh, tend to uh, hold water longer, remain uh, cooler uh, longer, and that can increase uh, uh, seedling disease and seedling mortality. Uh, so just be aware that uh, the preferred soil types are more uh, are well-drained soils. Our soil temperatures, uh, we prefer to see this between 45 and 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, 45 preferred on the fiber uh, because we can plant that a little sooner. The grain, we would prefer to see 50 degrees or warmer uh, at, at planting time. The optimum air temperature is going to be somewhere between 65 and 75 degrees. Uh, we're, we're going to be well above that uh, during our summers here in Wisconsin, which is fine. Uh, this, this plant will grow during those times, but uh, there, there is an optimum range for the, the plant itself. 
Um, moisture requirements, uh, according to last year, we will not have to worry about this, but um, minimum uh, of 10 to 15 inches per year. Uh, uh, we, we do work in other states as well, uh, the Dakotas as well as Montana, uh, sometimes have a hard time hitting this minimum requirement on their dry land acres. Um, although this crop does not like wet weather, uh, it tends to be a thirsty crop. It likes to, it likes to drink water or be irrigated regularly uh, as opposed to being uh, uh, I guess saturated uh, over a period of time. Uh, fertility, uh, I'll get into this here in a minute, but uh, we want to avoid marginal soils with low fertility. Uh, there is a, uh, a myth out there that this crop will grow uh, anywhere, including our lowest uh, fertility ground. Uh, while we might be able to get this crop to grow, it will likely not be profitable. So we want to target uh, our higher, more productive soils uh, than our, our marginal soils with low fertility. And again, uh, the photo period, uh, we need more than 10 hours of darkness to initiate uh, flowering. Uh, so when we look at what excess moisture does, uh, this is a photo from last season in 2018 uh, with a, a grain field. Um, the first 30 days can be some of the more harmful to this plant. Uh, you can see here, this picture is within the first 30 days. Uh, it is, this is not the first rain that it had on this field. Um, this significantly increases the potential for seedling diseases and plant mortality. Uh, this is just a crop that does not like wet weather. And especially early on, uh, we reduce stand counts uh, when this happens. Uh, we can delay seed germination uh, and cause uneven emergence if we have uh, a lot of rain early on. Uh, we, we can reduce uh, vigor and competitive, competitiveness with weeds. As you can see in the photo there, uh, most of what's green is our grasses. Uh, our foxtail and barnyard grass uh, do not have as much issue with wet weather as what our hemp does. So. Generally what happens is this crop will sit and, and remain at its roughly the same height uh, until it dries out and then begins its uh, growth again. So we just have to be aware that we can't control weather and weather will be a major impact with uh, this crop, whether rain or fiber or even CBD at that matter. So one of the things that I try to target with uh, talking to farmers about uh, is probably one of the most important factors in my mind is field selection. And of field selection, the two most key factors in deciding which fields to plant on are, we have to look at our, the map of our farm and identify our most productive fields. And when we find those fields, we also want to look to see of those fields, which ones have the least amount of weed pressure on them. Those are our two main factors that we should be looking at when we try to select fields to grow this crop on. They will allow for the most success uh, for anybody who's growing for the first time. Uh, we then start looking at other factors such as well-drained soils. Um, we want to avoid fields with compaction. Uh, this is a crop that is very sensitive to problematic areas in the field. Uh, it will identify areas of the field where you have issues, whether that be saturated portions of the field, compacted areas, low fertility, disease areas. This is a crop that uh, will actually help you identify which problems you need to uh, deal with in the future with other crops. Uh, being that hemp is susceptible to white mold, uh, sclerotinia, uh, we want to avoid fields that have a, a long history with white mold. Uh, and, and, and further than this, uh, we want to consider rotating after soybeans because soybeans is also a host for white mold. So we, we can increase the potential for white mold occurrence if we were to plant after soybeans as opposed to corn. Um, if we do plant after corn, generally we'll see an increased nitrogen demand uh, simply for the fact that we have the corn stalks to break down in the soil. 
Uh, this crop does require a fair amount of nitrogen, uh, at least for grain crop. Uh, so we may uh, need to increase our nitrogen uh, applications uh, following corn. Uh, specifically to organic farmers, uh, we had a lot of organic production in Wisconsin last season, and uh, the, the largest problem that we faced was weed pressure. Uh, most organic farmers understand this, that uh, it is more difficult to control weeds in organic systems. So we need to do all that we can to reduce the potential for weeds. Uh, and one of the main ways that we do this is, is by selecting the right fields, first of all. Uh, but we may need to consider which crop we're following in the rotation on an organic system more so than what we need to consider that on a conventional system. Uh, most organic farmers understand that uh, any crop following an alfalfa, sod, plow down, or a clover legume cover crop will likely provide the least amount of weed pressure the following year for the next crop. This is really where we need to target this for organic production. Uh, we had a lot of farmers last season who planted after corn, uh, after soybeans, after wheat, uh, it didn't really matter uh, in, in any of those scenarios except for the farms who planted after alfalfa. They were about the only ones organically who did not have much weed pressure out there. The problem that we had last year was that we had a ton of rain early season and organic production uh, rain early season is not a good, uh, good combination. So unless we have a good setup to naturally reduce the weed pressure, uh, like following alfalfa or a, a sod, a, another legume sod cover crop. Uh, we may be able to find some uses following winter rye. Uh, this is something I know Dr. Aaron Silva is working on quite a bit with uh, soybeans. Uh, there may be some uh, ways to implement either uh, No-tilling into rye, uh, which we have not done any experiments on, uh, which would be uh, interesting to see. Um, or we just simply follow a terminated uh, winter rye crop, uh, knowing that because the seed is small, that we want to allow for that uh, 10 to 14 day window to reduce the allelopathic uh, chemicals from the rye. Uh, we have seen some instances where this allelopathy may have some impact on, on hemp growth initially. So uh, just be aware of that if we're following a, a winter rye cover crop. Uh, again, rotation after quarter soybeans organically, uh, we are likely going to see higher wheat potential here uh, just because we've left the soil uh, without a cover crop in, in most of those scenarios and it allows for higher wheat production. Uh, one other method we could do to reduce weed uh, uh, competitiveness is by increasing our planting rates for the organic uh, to do more of a smother effect uh, in this essence. We, we think of this sometimes in other crops as, as a means to reduce weed, com uh, weed competitiveness. So we may be able to do that here with hemp as well. Uh, fertility, uh, this is a crop very similar to others that the nutrient demand uh, increases with plant age, uh, which generally is at its greatest at flowering time. Uh, the pH range is really quite large, uh, six to seven and a half. Uh, so most farmers in this state should be well suited for, for that pH range. Uh, with a grain crop, we're looking at uh, about 100 to 125 pounds of nitrogen, as opposed to a fiber crop of only 40 to 60 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, now, this is actually something that was opposite of, of what I had initially assumed. Uh, it, it's the reason we are applying less nitrogen as a fiber crop is because this crop does grow very quickly uh, on its own during its rapid growth stage. And by adding a lot of nitrogen, we accelerate that extremely. In a fiber crop, that makes a difference because uh, what happens is the cell walls become thinner and we reduce the quality of fiber by that process. So we, don't, we actually don't want it to grow as quickly as possible uh, in the fiber crop because we need good uh, cell wall strength to have good fiber strength uh, and, and high quality fibers. Uh, especially being that uh, a good portion of this nitrogen is in the stock material. 
As far as phosphorus is concerned, we generally recommend 40 to 70 pounds per acre for both a grain and fiber crop. Uh, the phosphorus is usually stored mostly in the seed itself. Uh, that is primarily where it's at, as well as the flowers uh, uh, during that flowering period. Potassium is uh, usually recommended between 60 and 100 pounds per acre uh, for grain and 250 and 350 pounds per acre for fiber. Uh, the reason this is such a large difference between the two is mainly for the fact that the vast majority of potassium is stored in the stalks. And with our fiber crops, we are generally twice the height, uh, if not three times the height of our grain crops. So we have a tremendous amount of potassium uh, need for a taller crop like our fiber crops. Sulfur uh, generally uh, in this 15 to 25 pounds per acre. When we get into planting, uh, we want a firm, shallow seed bed. Um, I like telling farmers to think more in terms of planting alfalfa as opposed to other crops. Uh, we, we look to having a, a, a firm seed bed by using a, rolling, a roller or a packer uh, to have good seed to soil content our contact, uh, our planting depth uh, is a range between a quarter to three quarters of an inch. Uh, we may be able to seed at a, a one inch depth on our sandier soils and drier conditions, uh, but our target uh, depth is one half inch. Uh, get our planting rates uh, for uh, 40 to 60 pounds per acre for fiber, uh, 25 to 35 pounds per acre uh, for grain. Uh, again, our, our planting methods, uh, green drill, air drill, brilliant cedar broadcaster, uh, corn planter. Uh, if we are using a corn planter, uh, we will need to look to uh, using our sorghum plates uh, in the planters uh, as, as that seed size is very similar to hemp. Uh, planting dates, uh, generally we're going to try to plant our fiber crop a little earlier. Uh, as I mentioned before, this crop does not start to flower until after the summer solstice. So uh, we will get more vegetative growth the earlier we plant this crop. So uh, as a fiber crop, we want as much growth as possible. So we try to plant uh, sometime in the month of April uh, when we know that the, the uh, potential for our last killing freeze is, is gone. Uh, we can plant that as, as late into May as necessary, but keeping note that uh, more vegetative growth is going to come the earlier we plant. Uh, grain production, usually between May and June, of that soil temperature of 50 degrees or more. Uh, I would say once we get to the middle of June and beyond, uh, we significantly start reducing our yield potential. Uh, the majority of farms uh, are likely going to plant the last week of May and the first week of June. Uh, that, that is a, a pretty good time for uh, so warm soils uh, and, and just uh, good germination and, and emergence. The biggest factor I would say during planting, uh, and this goes back to what we talked about earlier, is that we this goes against a lot of logic that most farmers have, is that we should be planting after a rain rather than before. Uh, a lot of farmers try to get their crops planted before the next rain. They're looking at the forecast and, and rain is on the horizon. Um, it will be best if this crop is uh, held off and, and waited, wait this rain out to plant afterwards because of the facts uh, that, that we talked about earlier of this crop not uh, being very friendly to wet conditions. Um, it does not take very long to germinate this crop. Usually uh, uh, within 24 to 48 hours, we see germination and emergence generally between uh, four to seven to 10 days. I got a little ahead of myself there. Uh, so our, uh, when we do see emergence happen, uh, we enter into the slow growth phase, uh, what, similar to what we see in the top photo here. Uh, we'll generally see anywhere between 8 to 12 inches of growth in the first 30 days, 30 to 45 days or so, and then 
uh, we start to see the plants begin to elongate and enter into the rapid growth stage, uh, what we see on the photo below. Um, here in this rapid growth stage, which generally occurs uh, day 30 to day 60, just depending on the variety and, and environment, uh, we'll usually see that one to three inches of growth per day. Uh, and in a 30 day period, we can easily see uh, two to four or even five feet of growth in a 30 day period. So it, when it hits the stage, it's very quick to grow. Uh, so once we passed uh, the summer solstice on June 21st, we start to enter into the reproductive phase and flowering begins. Uh, the photo here, you can see the male flowers uh, showing um, a more evident. Uh, the female flowers are there, but uh, a little more difficult to see in the photo. Um, maturity will happen generally in the day 100 to 110 after planting. Uh, this is different maturity uh, than what we typically talk about with corn. Uh, corn is a relative maturity based on heat units, uh, where this is uh, more specific to a calendar date. Uh, so we can just about look at our calendar and count out 100 days and we should have a mature crop at roughly that time frame. Uh, harvest is going to occur for grain uh, at roughly day 110 to 130. This time frame will be generally the, uh, the middle to end of September or the beginning half of October. Uh, we want the grain moisture to be in the range of 12 to 18 percent at harvest time, uh, which, which again will allow for quite a bit of green material uh, in the stalks and, and leaf uh, matter. As far as harvesting a fiber crop, uh, this will generally occur at day 70 to 90 after planting. Uh, this will happen, mowing will occur likely in the month of July or early August. Uh, basically the stage that we see this photo here uh, is roughly the stage that we're going to be targeting uh, our mowing our fiber crop. Uh, once the, the crop is laid on the ground and left to ret for roughly a, uh, a month, uh, we're going to bale that in the month of uh, the end of August or likely the beginning half of September, uh, targeting a bale moisture of 10 to 12 percent or less. Uh, so there, there is some uh, uh, studies out there that show some of the effects that, that can happen to the soil with using this crop in a rotation. Uh, we tend to see in, uh, improvements in soil structure as well as soil tilt. Uh, those two factors alone can help in, uh, increase infiltration and uh, also help with soil moisture. Uh, being that this crop does usually have a, a fairly deep tap root, uh, it helps to increase nutrient cycling as well, bringing uh, nutrients from the subsoil closer to the upper portions uh, of the, the topsoil. Uh, allowing for this crop and other future crops to utilize those uh, acquired nutrients. Uh, being that the root is fairly large, uh, it, we can help to reduce uh, nutrient leaching, uh, such as nitrogen. Um, this is a crop that does require a fair bit of nitrogen, so uh, we, we can, especially later in the season, reduce uh, any um, nutrient leaching from from nitrates uh, or, or other nutrients of that. Uh, one of the, the unique things about this crop is it is used in uh, a phyto remediation of contaminated soils, uh, particularly with heavy metals uh, uh, and, and nuclear waste sites. Uh, industrial hemp has actually been used at the Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant site to help reclaim a lot of the soils of, uh, that have been contaminated there. Um, this is one point to be aware of uh, during your production systems uh, after harvesting is that uh, processors are beginning to start testing for heavy metal concentrations. So whether that's seed or flour from our CBD crops, uh, there is a, a, a more momentum coming from processors to test for heavy metals because this crop is an accumulator of these heavy metals. So if you are aware 
that your fields have and contain heavy metals like lead or cadmium or uh, other heavy metals, uh, be cautious of planting this crop on those fields and, and uh, it would be a good idea to test uh, your crop sometime mid-season to know just where you're at uh, with your testing levels. So uh, as far as pests are concerned, uh, weeds were one of the biggest pests that we encountered last season in Wisconsin. Uh, this photo is an organic uh, uh, crop here. Uh, we can see in the photo that we have uneven uh, height. Uh, we have a couple plants that have started elongation, uh, while a few others have not, and we seem to have a fairly uniform weed crop there. Uh, so uh, field selection, again, is going to be very critical, um, and probably more so on the organic side of things than, than the conventional farms. We did not see nearly the weed pressure on our conventional farms is what we did organic farms last season. Uh, so it will be more critical for organic farmers to get this one right. Uh, as I mentioned, planting after a legume sod crop can help reduce weed pressure. Uh, planting after a rain instead of before can help reduce weeds. Uh, if we find a drier period uh, during our planting uh, time frame, we should try to plant at the beginning of that dry period to allow for our crop to get germinated, uh, get out of the ground before our first rain occurs, uh, which will then stimulate weed growth uh, and, and weed production. Uh, having uh, fertile soils will help our crop, the hemp crop, uh, compete well with weeds, and then just simply having well-drained soils will, will also help this. Uh, there is a lot of uh, talk uh, especially in the organic community of the use of calcium, particularly gypsum or lime, to help reduce uh, weed occurrence. Um, this, this is kind of anecdotal uh, in the sense where we are more flocculating our soils and, and allowing better infiltration. Uh, foxtail tends to be the biggest uh, weed that, that uh, is, is sometimes reduced by these methods. Um, and then using Compost as opposed to manure is another way that we can reduce weed seeds. Uh, raw manure is a great source of weed seeds and uh, raw nutrients that stimulate weed growth. Uh, compost is the most broken down form of those nutrients and has likely gone through, if it's been gone through a proper heating, uh, it's likely that most of the weed seeds that were contained have been uh, uh, made unviable are non-viable through that heating process in the composting. So compost would be the preferred over manure, raw manure. Uh, weed control during the first 30 days is the most critical. Uh, this photo here is during the first 30 days of growth. Uh, uh, the crop, the hemp crop is not seeming that competitive against those weeds. Uh, we, we have to do what we can to get this crop to the rapid growth stage uh, because once we hit that stage, uh, there is no other weed that will compete with growth. So if we can keep the weeds relatively uh, free from the field during the first 30 days, uh, the next 30 days and beyond will be virtually weed free as well. Uh, there may be opportunities to look at uh, mechanical means of uh, weed control using a rotary hoe, tined weeder, harrow, or even a cultivator for those on 22 inch rows or 30 inch rows. Uh, I do believe that the tine weeder or harrow is likely going to be uh, the machine of choice. I, the rotary hoe is likely going to be too aggressive. Um, and, and most farmers will understand this once they grow this crop in the first uh, two weeks to three weeks. Uh, it's, it's a very tender uh, uh, crop that we don't really want to damage at that, at that point in time. Disease will uh, either be the most or the second most uh, problematic pest in, in uh, uh, grain or fiber uh, production. Uh, two molds in particular, we have white mold, which is uh, sclerotinia sclerotiorum, uh, and gray mold, botrytis cinerea. Uh, these are, are, are the two most common molds found in diseases in uh, industrial hemp period. Uh, the photo here is a picture of uh, sclerotinia. Uh, the disease 
plant on the left is an advanced stage where the plant is almost entirely dead uh, with the right plants uh, at the beginning stages. We can tell this with the water-soaked lesions on the leaves uh, that, that give away this, this type of disease. Uh, so our conditions that are conducive for uh, molds, these particular molds, as well as really any mold, uh, are high humidity conditions uh, where we have drizzly days or, or foggy conditions, something we could think of maritime-like um, if we were to be living along the coastal regions, uh, and our cool to moderate temperatures, uh, similar to what we get overnight. Uh, we had a lot of foggy uh, nights and mornings last season, and it just allowed for a large portion of every day or very uh, most days to be ideal for mold growth. Um, we saw this disease come in at the end of August, early September timeframe, which would have been two to three weeks prior to harvest. So there was really nothing that could have been done as, as a rescue for this crop uh, nor are there any products labeled for this crop to have a, a rescue. Uh, so what we need to do to avoid disease is more preventative measures as opposed to um, trying to cure uh, a problem that's already there. Uh, so the first thing uh, goes back to choosing the right fields. Uh, we want to avoid fields that have a history of white mold or gray mold. Uh, those fields will have sclerotia bodies uh, that, that will survive uh, upwards of five to seven, eight years in the soil. Uh, so it's a very long uh, lifespan that these sclerotia bodies have. So uh, if we've had problems in soybeans, we should be avoiding those fields with them. Uh, we should consider rotating after corn rather than soybeans in that scenario. Uh, even better uh, if we were able to rotate after a sod crop, uh, we have even less chance of these diseases uh, showing up. We can reduce plant populations, uh, which, will, uh, which is one uh, method used in soybeans to reduce white mold. Uh, the, by lowering our plant populations, we increase airflow underneath the canopy, uh, allowing that soil to dry out more. Um, in addition to this, if we can keep the weeds out of the field, uh, the weeds that we had last year were also uh, adding to the biomass uh, and, and restricting airflow, so increasing uh, this um, microclimate underneath the, the canopy, which allowed for perfect conditions for this mold to occur. Uh, deep tillage can bury sclerotia bodies. However, uh, like I mentioned, these these sclerotia bodies are long lived, and we may at the same time be able to bring up uh, former uh, sclerotia bodies from previous years. So just be aware of that. Uh, we may be able to use uh, preventative biological fungicides. Uh, there are uh, several of them out there. Contans is one of them, uh, Mycophyter. Uh, these are more um, either bacteria or fungi based type of uh, fun biological fungicides that are either uh, seed applied or foliar applied, and most of them are endophytic uh, and use the means of, um, I guess, preventative, preventing these pathogens from entering the cells of, of the plant. As far as insects, uh, we did not have much of a problem with insects uh, in the grain crop last season in Wisconsin. Um, however, we did see a significant amount of seed corn maggot, which was a uh, picture in the upper corner there. Uh, this was not expected. Uh, seed corn maggot is a pest of hemp, but it has never been noted to be a significant pest. Um, Western Wisconsin seemed to have a significant problem with this last season. Um, in the photo there, you, can't, you can see the two sea corn maggots in the foreground. There is one crawling away in the background, and this is off of just simply one seedling. Uh, so we had significant uh, uh, germination problems, emergence problems, and uh, overall seedling mortality. Uh, that particular seedling is dead. Uh, they've just been living inside, feeding on it. 
Uh, now, greenhouse production may be different, and, and I think we'll hear about this uh, the next talk about CBD. Uh, insect pests are much more common and, and problematic uh, with our CBD crops. Uh, however, um, we do see aphids. Uh, we did find a few uh, fields with aphids last season. Uh, white flies can be a problem. European corn borer can be a problem, although we did not see any of that uh, issue last year. The main insect that we saw were the two that are shown here, seed corn maggot, as well as the Japanese beetle. Uh, the Japanese beetle, for whatever reason, uh, seems to be greatly attracted to the male pollen uh, from, from hemp. And uh, we, everywhere I went to inspect fields, there were beetles crawling all over the male inflorescence of, of these hemp plants. Very little activity on the females. Uh, and I kind of jokingly mentioned that uh, we may be able to plant hemp as a catch crop uh, next to our soybeans to attract uh, these beetles away uh, from our soybean crop, at least for the period of pollination. Uh, being that we're going to have a second series to talk about harvest, I won't get into harvest uh, uh, a whole lot of detail here, but uh, I'll just go through the, quickly the grain and the fiber overview. Um, we are trying to target a moisture of 12 to 18 percent uh, at harvest time of the grain. Uh, that grain will need to be dried to 9 percent uh, and needs to get onto some type of drying uh, aeration bin uh, within four to six hours uh, once that combine has been unloaded uh, uh, with a full hopper uh, on board. Uh, we do recommend straight cutting uh, as opposed to swapping. Uh, and with our straight cut uh, method, uh, draper headers are the preferred uh, uh, equipment to use. Uh, our auger headers uh, tend to allow more slugs going through the combine, which can increase the potential of the fiber wrapping around shafts and bearings. Uh, the fiber wrapping is the reason why we prefer straight cutting as opposed to swapping, which is the bottom photo here. Uh, there is just a tremendous amount of fiber going through the machine with a swap uh, that size. Uh, we did have a couple farmers do this last season in Wisconsin. They were, they were successful with it. Uh, if we are going to swap this crop, it needs to lay in a windrow only for 24 to 72 hours. The drier that this stock material becomes, the, the more we increase the potential for wrapping around shafts and bearings. So we are simply just trying to get some of the moisture out of the stock material if we swap. When we look at a fiber crop, um, uh, we have uh, our mowing is going to occur first. Uh, that'll be the first week to two weeks uh, into pollination which will be that July, August timeframe. Uh, we want to leave somewhere around four to six inches of stubble to reduce the ash content in the bales or the amount of uh, soil that we're bringing in with the bales. Uh, a lot of these processors do not like that kind of contamination. So uh, cutting a little bit higher uh, is ideal. Uh, raking will occur uh, once the stalks begin to turn from a green to pale yellow color. Uh, that will be the first time we start to rake. Uh, we could see that uh, we need to rake this crop one to three times, just depending on how evenly the rutting is, is occurring. Um, the rutting period will generally last two to six weeks, just depending on how dry or wet the environment is. Uh, the rutting is essentially a controlled or semi-controlled uh, rotting. Uh, in the field. This is where microbial activity uh, separates the, the fiber, the vast fibers from the herd uh, and uh, allows for the processors to have much easier times uh, uh, separating those fibers from one another. Once the crop it, uh, looks like the top photo there, uh, very similar to you could think of uh, wheat straw or other small grain straw, uh, that's roughly the time that we're going to go out and bale. Uh, the moisture should be uh, less than 12% at that time. And uh, preferably, we would uh, uh, bale this in a large square bale, which is easier to transport. 
uh, and, and for the most part easier to process with uh, many of these processes. Uh, so just to kind of recap, uh, as far as uh, things to think about for planting this uh, grain or fiber crop, uh, my opinion that field selection is one of the most important factors uh, out of your entire operation. This will determine how successful you are uh, based on whether you choose the right fields or not. Uh, again, we want well-drained soils, our most productive soil uh, fields that have the least amount of weed pressure, and uh, specific to organic, we need to consider uh, following alfalfa or clover as opposed to corn or uh, soybeans. Uh, early season weed control will be critical. Uh, those first 30 days is going to be essential. Uh, for conventional farmers, um, we can use a pre-plant or pre-emergent herbicide as a burn down, uh, whether we use Roundup or a non-residual herbicide that is possible, uh, making sure that we have very little residual from that herbicide. Uh, we don't have a good handle on which herbicides this crop is susceptible uh, so it's good practice to think that every herbicide may cause uh, problems in this crop at this point. Um, uh, mechanical means uh, may be possible, uh, but will likely be limited to uh, our, our smaller tools like uh, our tine weeder, our harrow, uh, and possibly a rotary hoe. Uh, we want to think of good ways, uh, ways to promote rapid emergence in seedling growth. This helps to compete with weeds as well. Good seedbed preparation is, is a means to allow our crop uh, to have an advantage over the weed seeds. Uh, having good fertility is also important. We get our crop, once it's out of the ground, it starts to utilize the nutrients and uh, essentially doesn't look back from there. Uh, it's good practice to regularly scout fields and identify uh, different stresses, whether that be pests, uh, nutrient uh, deficiencies, uh, uh, drought and moisture stress, things like that. It's a very good idea to just walk your fields at least once a week, uh, if not more uh, often, uh, if you desire. So with that, I'm just gonna leave this up here uh, as uh, some resources for those interested in grain or fiber production. Uh, the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance website is an extremely great uh, online uh, uh, source of information for both grain and fiber, as well as a lot of these other uh, resources here. So with that, if we do have a few questions here. Um, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> and you've got two uh, minutes. So, no pressure. Um, there was a couple of comments to termination of winter rye just 10 days prior to a heavy feeding feeder would be cutting it pretty close and result in significant end tie up. So, I think suggesting you may need to terminate rye a little earlier because of its end. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, let's see. Can you move forward to after 10 o'clock, Tony, so we get the one specific? to starting at 10. We'll go back to some of those older ones, I apologize. Uh, this type of production could severely impact the CBD market. Kind of scary knowing it could be next door to your CBD and cross-pollinate and ruin your crop. We will talk about that. That's going to get talked about in the CBD hour. Okay, 10.02 I think was the... There, okay, 10.06. Which part of the plant is used for CBD production? That'll be happening soon. Are you or other contractors looking for fiber or seed farmers for contract? If yes, how do we connect with them? Uh, yeah, we are looking for additional grain farmers for this season in 2019. Uh, and, and anybody looking to work, whether they want to just simply buy seed, uh, or purchase seed and sell their, their grain back, uh, they can go to our website, uh, LegacyHemp.com. All right, so economics of grain production. That's probably the top question you get asked. <laughs> Any comments on that? Yeah, so I could go through quickly uh, uh, some of the more fixed costs that we have associated with this crop, and farmers will need to uh, plug in their own variable costs, but 
As far as the seeding cost goes, uh, we are recommending 30 pounds per acre as a seeding rate. Uh, our seed is priced at $4 per pound, which comes to a price of $120 per acre. Uh, the fertility cost uh, conventionally will likely be uh, in that $80 to $120 per acre um, with organic production. Uh, likely uh, higher than that, somewhere in that 150, uh, possibly upwards of 200 pounds per acre. If we're really uh, trying to apply all the nitrogen as a um, purchase source. Uh, so uh, in addition to that, we're going to have a cleaning cost or the farmers will have a cleaning cost. Uh, likely two cleanings, one prior to going into the grain bin to be aerated and dried. Uh, and then one uh, just prior to shipping to the processor, that cost will likely be somewhere in the neighborhood of $80 per acre. Uh, so that, that total brings us roughly in that $300 to $350 per acre with the fixed costs specific to hemp. Uh, from there, uh, we'll need, uh, far, each farmer will need to add in their own land cost uh, uh, fuel, labor, et cetera, uh, for the total cost of inputs uh, as, as they relate to each specific farm. Uh, in regard to what kind of uh, gross profits they could expect, uh, conventional crops generally have been yielding in that 12 to 1400 pounds per acre, uh, while the organic crops are yielding more in that six to 800 pounds per acre. Uh, currently, for the 2019 growing season, uh, we are uh, offering contracts at 55 cents per pound for conventional production and $1.20 per pound for certified organic. So you should be able to work those numbers out for your own farm and, and figure out where you are net profit wise. Uh, is there a limit to how many years you can plant hemp in one field? Uh, there's no limits as far as legality is concerned, uh, uh, but as far as agronomics, um, I certainly wouldn't look at planting this crop more than two years in a row on the same field. Uh, we just, we don't know what all diseases, uh, insects, and other pests we're going to encounter with this new crop, uh, and the more we monocrop uh, on the same field year after year, uh, the more likely we're going to have pest problems uh, start showing up. Here you go. Okay. All right. Um, have there been studies on hemp roots breaking up the subsoil hard pan? Please comment on soil aeration and heavy soils if possible. So I have not seen many studies uh, for using this crop as, as a means to break through a hard pan with uh, compacted soils. Um, it will be a crop that will identify compacted areas which uh, kind of signals to me that it's not likely making its way through those uh, compacted layers. So uh, I, I, I would use uh, some other source like a tillage radish or some other means to uh, take care of your, your hard pan plow layer. All right, short days of less than 10 hours per night was said to be required. Daylight length less than 14 hours did not occur until mid-August in southern Wisconsin. And on that date is 6.5 hours of night uh, dark. Is there a variety of flexibility for day length response? So there, uh, each variety is, is a little specific to this, but they all generally uh, will start flowering once the days do start getting shorter uh, because this plant recognizes that for every day that it's sitting out in the ground after planting, the days are getting longer. Until that summer solstice occurs, the days will start getting shorter. So the plant will recognize this uh, and the further south we go, uh, the longer it will likely take to recognize this, uh, but um, just simply the fact that our days are getting shorter will start to initiate flowering. Uh, if you're planting on a field that has been in winter wheat, is it necessary to remove the wheat before planting? 
I don't know if they mean uh, That's a good question. Um, as far as grain production is concerned, uh, most almost all of this crop at this time is being sold on the food grade market. Uh, in fact, there is no animal feed market at this time. It's still illegal to feed this uh, crop to livestock. Uh, so the only market being food grade, uh, most of these processors are selling this crop as gluten free, which means that uh, we do not want to have wheat still standing in the field prior to hemp production. And for those who are, are utilizing wheat in the rotations, uh, just be sure that the combines and augers are well cleaned prior to uh, moving your, your uh, or combining and harvesting your hemp crop. Great. Does your planting date that you gave refer to seeds or seedlings? Uh, the planting date refers to seeds. Okay. What are the spacings between row and plants within a row for seed oil production? Uh, so this crop has... Uh, Hemp is generally uh, has has approximately twenty five thousand seeds per pound, uh, and we're planting at a rate of about thirty pounds per acre for grain. That gives us somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred to nine hundred thousand plants per acre. Um, row spacing will generally be uh, with a grain drill around seven and a half inches between rows. Uh, if we're using a planter, um, we can we can use 15 inch rows, 22 inch rows, or or 30 inch rows. Uh, I think we'll find, and we are doing some studies uh, across the country on row spacing this year. I think we'll find that 15 inch row uh, spacing for grain production will be ideal. Uh, row spacing for a fiber crop should be uh, more narrow. Uh, into the seven and a half, uh, just because we want to encourage uh, this rapid growth uh, in, in tall plants. All right, I'm gonna quick pick a quick answer one. Where do you get dryers for this crop? Um, well, again, we don't want to run this through a grain dryer. Uh, we do not really want to apply heat. Uh, if we apply heat, it needs to be less than 100 degrees or less. Uh, preferably, we simply put the grain into a grain bin and turn the air fans on and let it dry with simply uh, forced air with aeration. All right, maybe a longer one. Can you provide the research on nutrient cycling and phytoremediation? As an annual plant, not sure how you're going to improve soil structure and soil tilt unless you can work this into a no-till system. Well, I think, yeah, this is, that's a good, good point. Uh, this, this is also the argument with some uh, cover crops. Uh, we use uh, tillage radish uh, and, and other crops to, uh, for example, buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat is a very uh, great plant at, at uh, cycling nutrients in the soil. It's an annual crop. Uh, there is nutrient cycling that happens even with annual crops as well. Okay, uh, what kind of processing facilities are in the state that you're aware of? Uh, processing facilities in Wisconsin for grain and fiber, um, at this point in time, I am not aware of any. Uh, most, most of the processors are just simply handlers of this crop, uh, meaning that they're storing this crop for others, uh, whether it be a central location for farmers to bring their grain to or, or something to that effect. Nobody that I'm aware of in Wisconsin is actually processing grain or fiber. All right, uh, what is the animal feed legislation for industrial hemp? Uh, well, Melody might be able to talk about this a little bit more, but um, uh, this crop has to go through uh, what is called the Generally Recognized as Safe Feeding Study uh, Program. Uh, the FDA requires this for any new feed ingredient. It has nothing to do with the fact that hemp is hemp. It's just simply that it's a new feed ingredient. Right, maybe one more. Uh, are there varieties less susceptible to mold that Legacy will be offering this year? Uh, at, at, <clears throat> excuse me, at this current time, we're only offering one particular variety. Um, however, we are working with uh, uh, a couple different universities, University of Illinois, uh, uh, possibly Purdue University, and we'll hear what, what's going on with uh, Wisconsin here. They are doing a disease susceptibility variety trial uh, with these other states. So we will have more information on that 
uh, next season. All right. Somebody would like contact information for your company. I'm sure we can provide that. Yeah, legacyhemp.com. Okay. All right. We need to move on to CBD. It is 11 o'clock. So let's do a change of uh, presenters up here.